Welcome to Through Your Looking Glass, a podcast that explores the world of research technology. Combining speed and insights, ResTech reflects a deeper knowledge of the people around us. We're leading the conversation about this complex industry, which spans from traditional market research to advertising, media measurement, and beyond. Join us as we chat with experts and enthusiasts in the ResTech community and learn more about its evolution, application, and ever-growing potential. Welcome to this episode of Through Your Looking Glass. My name is Patrick Comer, once again, the founder and CEO of Lucid. And I'm very honored today to have uh, Deb Elam with us, who is um, a new board member for Lucid, who has come on board uh, literally this year. And so I'm excited to welcome her to this show, but also help you get to know her better and for me to get to know her better as well. So Deb, welcome to uh, Through Your Looking Glass. Thanks, Patrick. It's great to be here. Well, Deb, I'm sure that uh, people really want to hear about your background and your history, given the extensiveness yeah. of it. Um, and I want to give you a moment just to share a little bit about where you come from and um, how you really got associated with uh, the Lucid Company. Sure. Happy to do so. So I am a native New Orleanian, born and raised here, uh, went to Ursuline Academy, Graduated from LSU uh, with a bachelor's degree and then got my master's at Southern University in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I was recruited in between my two years of graduate school by GE. Um, I joined, I interned actually with GE. I started hmm. as an intern. I'm one of those few rare people. I started as an intern. Wow. And um, yeah, and um, then joined one of the leadership development training programs there. Um, spent the next 30 years at GE, relocating nine times, living all over the country, uh, running HR for a lot of different business units, and then culminating um, as the global chief diversity officer and president and CEO of the foundation. So I had about $130 million uh, philanthropic budget uh, that I that I oversaw for the company. Um, I was the first black female corporate officer in GE's history. Um, and I'm very proud of that. So um, after 30 years, um, I said, okay, that's plenty. And um, decided to relocate home to New Orleans where I've launched a consulting business called Corporate Playbook. Um, and we do four things. We do um, diversity and philanthropic uh, consulting, helping companies launch, develop a diversity strategy, helping them tie that to philanthropy if that's something they'd like to do, which makes a lot of sense. Um, we, I do executive coaching, so C-suite, pre-C-suite, really helping leaders be their very best. Um, I do crisis management in the diversity space. So if somebody has a bad comment or, or an ad that's not quite what it should be, helping them navigate with board members and employees and shareholders, et cetera. Um, and then I do speaking engagements um, all over. So uh, very busy. I have clearly flunked retirement, that's for sure. <laughs> you're not, uh, you're failing retirement. Like <laughs> You're I'm, failing, failing at retirement. I'm failing miserably at retirement. <laughs> uh, well, congratulations on uh, messing that up completely. That's a <laughs> that's a great story there. It sounds like you've got a lot going on. And I know that you do because uh, we have to carefully schedule time because it seems like your calendar and my <laughs> calendar are similar. They're completely yeah. busted most of the time. Yeah. Well, I wanted to lean in on this concept of a board member. Um, especially for a private company. I know that uh, the board can sometimes seem mysterious or what does a board do and what is the what is the role of a board member? Uh, but before we really, really get into that, how did you get associated with, with Lucid's board? What was that process like? Well, let me just say this. First of all, I'm, I'm happy to be associated with Lucid's board mm -hmm. and be a member. It's a great company, great footprint as, a, as headquartered in New Orleans, but certainly a global company. So I'm very excited and I'm very much still in learning mode. Mm. Uh, but Patrick, I'll, why don't I throw it back to you? You okay. tell me how, how we got to that part and I can tell you what the experience was on my <laughs> side. <laughs> okay. Well, I think it's important to put this in a spectrum of time. So we had come into uh, 2020, I guess, it's been a year now since all of COVID, but we had not expected to have the year that we're going to have. But we were already thinking about um, the fact that we could add and change over some of our board members. That was already on the docket. And for me personally, and as well as the rest of the board, we started really thinking about what is our relationship with the community? And what, 
building community is one of the core values at Lucid. It's one of the six things that we really focus on that we believe that a company's responsibility is not just to the employees, to the shareholders, to our customers, but also how do we engage in and impact the community around us? And we realized that we wanted to show our community that we were serious about representing New Orleans on our board. Because it's normal for a board to have, say, investors on it. And if you look at our board, there's plenty of investor types. Mm -hmm. We had brought in uh, other industry experts from our industry or from our business model. Uh, but we hadn't really brought someone in who represented where we were from. Um, and so, it, especially last summer after the murder of George Floyd, after a lot of the marches, a lot of the personal for myself investigation, what we needed to do, but also the employee base at Lucid is very active and appropriately so in making sure that we're really following through on our commitments and our ideas around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so I wanted to put those two things together. Let's have a scenario where, can you, where we're responding to appropriately that need, but also deeply embedding ourselves uh, and visibly so in the New Orleans community. And that came up through this process of engaging with potential candidates that represented uh, those ideals. But, so I think that's probably how you got involved, Deb, if I'm, if I'm thinking. <laughs> well, I, well, well, clearly, and, and look, I, um, I, everybody that I met along the journey at Lucid uh, that I met with was more and more impressive than the last person. Um, and, you know, my experience as a corporate person for 30 years living all over the country, but as a native New Orleanian, I think gave me a very unique set of skills and backgrounds and experiences uh, that I'm glad Lucid was very interested in. So, um, you know, for me, it's really exciting to bring all of those things to bear to help Lucid grow. Well, as I've said a few times, what's, what I've really loved about working with you so far, Deb, is your preparation. Um, and going to this concept of what is a board, what is a board member, one of the uh, behaviors that in my mind separates a good member from a great board member is preparation. Are you ready for the conversation? And so I've always been impressed with your, your just pre preparedness every time we have a conversation. So I, I just want to say thank you for, for doing that and really engaging at the level you have. Well, thank you. I mean, look, a board exists to uh, help the company with strategy to, um, to help uh, ensure that the shareholder, share owner, stakeholder value is there. Uh, it helps with uh, advice and counsel to the CEO and in many cases to the leadership team. Uh, and that's important. That matters to me. You know, it's not, uh, it's not jumping in and managing because we are not managers. We are we are oversight, if you will. Think of us as people who have had experience in a lot of different venues. Um, and in my case, it's business venues and in New Orleans, as you referenced. But it's really about how do I add value to you, Patrick, and to others based on my background? Uh, but, but it's really, the board is really to give advice, counsel, perspective, insight, um, and not manage and not get into the, the, the management detail. That's, that's for you and your team to do and you're doing it well. Well, as, the, as uh, our board likes to remind me, I am managing the company, right? The CEO and the manager is responsible for execution of the strategy and the board is responsible for helping shape and, and guide that strategy um, to fruition. And what do you think the big misconceptions are around the role of a, of a board member? Is it really about how much they manage or don't manage? Are there other, other challenges you've seen people uh, think about when they think of board members? Well, I think, uh, I think that's probably the biggest one. They probably okay. don't know where those lines are, where the, blur, you know, where the line is of management, if you will, day to day, and, and um, uh, you know, more helping with strategy, helping with perspective. Um, I think it's also important to note that I'm an independent director. And so when you've got a company like Lucid where you have investors, investors certainly bring a very clear perspective to the table. Independent directors uh, may share in that, but may also have um, additional different perspectives as well. So I think the board that works best is one where you really have diversity. You know, you talked a little bit about diversity. Diversity mm -hmm. on your board matters because it will give you almost what I'll call 360 degree vision of what is going on in the marketplace, what is going on in industry, uh, what's going on with talent leadership. So, um, so I think that's the misconception, like how deep does the board go versus really being kind of across the top of the house, if you will. 
Uh, that's exactly right. I, I see that misperception in some of the other board roles that I have that people don't understand that the board supports the CEO and management and provides that guidance, provides that insight, but it still is the management who delivers, makes the decisions and executes the strategy that, uh, of the organization. So that's really, I think people get confused and think the board has the, a certain power that they don't have. Um, yeah. At the same time, there there is um, a real power in the board. And um, as you said, diversity and having different types of members on your board is really important. How have you, how have you seen that play out at, at Lucid or other, other organizations? Oh, I think, and I'm on a couple of other boards as well, but I think it's uh, it plays out well because if you have people who are willing to engage on the board, willing to be very upfront, very uh, collegial, uh, but also not afraid to make a point, not afraid to dissent. You know, you don't want a bunch of yes people. You want people who are willing to have critical thinking, critical thoughts around um, the topic, whatever the topic is at hand. I think it works really well because again, everybody on the board should be working for the success of the company. That's the goal, right? The goal is always the same. You know, if you think about it in a, in a sports analogy, if the goal is the same to win, then everybody may have a different playbook. Um, you may say, hell, you know, this is the play that we wanna run uh, and then run that play, but run it to execution uh, where you get the goal of winning. Well, I know you haven't been on the Lucid board for too long, but maybe you have some first impressions of what uh, is different about the Lucid company or the Lucid board from your, your other experiences. Yeah, that's a great question, Patrick. I would say, um, and this isn't necessarily as different, I would say it's more similar, but the Lucid board members that I've interacted with have been very collegial, um, very engaged. So every time there's a call or a meeting, everybody's there. It's not like people, you know, and life happens, right? So sometimes people may have a conflict, but everybody's participated to the best of their ability. Um, when there's emails that go out, everybody responds quickly and, and is very clear to say, you know, given my background, here's what I think about this. So um, I, think, I think that's great. The one thing I would say that I really appreciate about the Lucid Board is the uh, you said I, I, my preparation is something that you like, and I, I always will show up in a very prepared way. That's just who I am. But you make it easy to do that because materials go out early enough. Um, your leadership team is certainly available for questions so that I feel like when I get to the board room, to the meeting itself, if I've done the work, if I've read everything and I have questions that I can be prepared because your team enables me to be prepared. That doesn't always happen. Sometimes you just sort of get it the day of, but I, I think it's great. Well, I, I, I'm i glad you noticed that we're preparing as well. Um, and this is, you know, I've been, I think I've done maybe 50 board meetings for Lucid, if not more over the past 10 years. Um, and I, by board, in that context, like quarterly board meetings where all the materials are prepped. And even if I think back to very early days, we were doing board meetings once every month, uh, which is a lot of preparation, but often very good for accountability and just getting the support you need. But we started realizing that we wanted to have a board meeting that was strategic versus updating on details. Right, right. And so we would, and still do it today, we get our, we get all of our materials out early and we set individual update calls where yeah. myself and our CFO meet with the board member and go through all the materials ahead of time so that all those questions that are important but don't necessarily need to be asked with everyone can be asked so you get the information you need but also gives you time to kind of think about it gel with it and then come yep. to the table to really engage with on the strategic matters at hand versus does a plus b equal c which is some of the questions that come up importantly so but are not necessarily a, a strategic question at the time yeah and what i even noticed at our last meeting is um because you did those individual meetings um, you and your CFO were able to notice some trends in questions. And so you were able to address that. And that I thought was great foresight on your part to say, hmm, three or four board members kind of had a comment or a question about this. Let's let, make sure we hit that on the agenda. I thought that was actually brilliant. That is literally one of the key other values is that we learn what's important in the mind of the board members. And then we come back with more information, sometimes answers, sometimes just more information, more context. And we reveal what the rest of the board is also thinking of that was important. So it's a it's a um, it's a dynamic process. I've actually come to really enjoy board meetings and really enjoyed the camaraderie, and honestly, for myself, the support both from a business standpoint, but also as a professional emotionally on on managing a, a fast growing organization. It's a I need all the help I can get if you know what I mean. <laughs>
You're doing great, Patrick. Doing great. <laughs> so far, so good. Yeah. Well, you have such a huge background in talent and leadership. And um, one of the areas, of course, that boards are interested in is this concept that we speak about diversity. But I think we also brought up this concept of cultural competency. Mm -hmm. And you know, one of the through lines that I think people are starting to realize is that cultural competency allows for a company to have direct correlation to, to innovation, also competitiveness. And so I'd love to talk a little bit more about how you're viewing this dialogue right now in corporate leadership around talent, around leadership, uh, but also around honestly diversity. It's a, it's you know, we're in this time frame where it's been over a year since the murder of George Floyd. We have a lot of companies who are thinking about um, the statements they made or didn't make a year ago. Um, so how is that playing out in your world these days? Yeah, well, um, in, a, in a big way. I mean, to your point, a lot of companies said a lot of things, um, you know, over a year ago. And so the question now is, um, what did you actually do? You said you were going to do something. Did you actually do that? And the accountability mm -hmm. there, you know, and I think both things can be true. You, you make a statement, but what are your actions? So I'm seeing a lot of companies um, sort of uh, given a scorecard, if you will on here's where we are. And, and, and I would say a candid scorecard because maybe you didn't do everything you said you were gonna do and that's okay. Yeah. Did you do most of it? Did you not do this because, you know, we were in the middle of a global pandemic as all of these things unfolded. So it's not like it's been a normal year by any stretch of the imagination. Um, you mentioned cultural competence. Cultural competence is a big deal. And I think people don't give it enough uh, credence you know, I want to work with people and have people work on my team or where I'm involved who understand how to navigate various cultures, who understand nuance. Um, it is really important. Uh, universities look for students who have cultural competence, who have had summer experiences where they um, have maybe been outside of the U.S. if it's if you're a U.S.-based student or outside of um, your home country into another place. That matters because it helps you think differently. It opens your eyes. It opens your mindset. Um, and, and for me, all of this is around um, framework, right? So the framework of how do I think about things? So if I only think about things very myopically, um, you're not going to get innovation. But if I have been trained, if I have been exposed to different stuff, then I'm open to possibilities. And the more you are open to possibilities, the more innovation can seep in. And I think that's what's really cool. That's what's exciting to me. And that's what I'm working on with a number of the clients um, with, with whom I engage. Well, I love this phrase of cultural competence um, because I think a lot of people will think of it in the context of America and our racial challenges, let's say. Mm -hmm. But one of the areas where I'll see a lot of cultural competency being required is being a global firm, period. Absolutely. And so um, a, a simple example of this, uh, the, the pandemic has played itself out in different stages at different levels across the planet. Every country, every state, every city almost has a different experience um, with the pandemic. Um, even in 2021, where the United States is rapidly opening, quickly followed behind by the UK. Our team in India has had the most dramatic experience with cases uh, of the pandemic growing very, very rapidly in, in Delhi and the, and the rest of that country. It's been quite dramatic for our, our team members. And so becoming a global firm requires up leveling and really digging into your cultural competence. And we've stumbled along our way and it's been, it's one of those areas where you're absolutely right. How do you think about things? Uh, are you open to possibilities? And can you even hear what the other person is actually saying? And it's, I have to say being a global firm first is when we first started being challenged by and, and started realizing the need for expanded cultural competence, if that, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it does. I would, I would add to that um, even as a U.S. only, if you were a U.S. only mm -hmm. firm, cultural competence has got to start at home because we've got a lot of cultures, a lot of nuance within the United States. So again, I talk a little bit sometimes right. about the duality of truth. So cultural competence can be cultures outside of the U.S. culture, but cultural competence can also be cultures within the U.S. culture. 
And both of those, um, you need to be effective at both of those. That is why I think some of the Black Lives Matter stuff, all of the things that came out were saying, there's stuff going on here that people were shocked by. Some people were shocked, some people weren't um, because it wasn't surprising to many people. To some people it was like, oh my God, I had no idea. To some people like this happens every day. So I think there's a, there's a real laboratory using that term that can be looked at, that can be studied, that can be learned, that can be practiced within the United States and built upon as you interface with people and cultures outside of the United States. I could not agree more. I mean, our largest market is the US and the United States is such a diverse place across the board and diversity among so many different directions, whether it's race, whether it's religion, or just where you're from in the United States. I mean, obviously we know there's a huge cultural difference between let's say Orleans Parish and Metairie, if you know what I mean. So there can be huge cultural differences and very short distances across the country. Yeah, and the more you can have competence in navigating those differences, be they you know, five or six miles away or 500 miles away or 5,000 miles away, um, it helps you as a leader. You know, leadership is the core of what you've got to do to be successful in running a company, both for you and your leadership team. It's core, it's essential. So how you understand, how you think about those things is what I think will help you lead more effectively, particularly as we sort of navigate a new normal coming out of the pandemic, coming out of some of the social justice stuff that's come forward. Um, it's the, the, the real secret sauce in my mind, the real glue is leadership. Speaking of leadership, you've been in a leadership role in the, in the front edge of DEI for 30 years. So you've seen, I imagine, quite a transition, or maybe not. So my first question, what is different about this subject, but also the actions taken around it and surrounding it? What's different about the narrative um, that really surprises you these days? Well, Patrick, I'm not that old, but <laughs> I'm not quite that old. Uh, but I've been I've been in the diversity work for a very long time. Let's say okay. let's leave it there. Um, very long time. I shouldn't have put any numbers. Long, long, okay, long enough. Long enough. Let's yes. just go with Ten very long time. Tenured. You're tenured in that track. I'm tenured. I'm seasoned. Seasoned is a word I like. <laughs> um, but what I'll say is, you know, what's different in the past? I think you know, there's been an evolution, like an evolution of in anything. Sure. Um, people, it was, you know, diversity was very black and white. And I mean that literally racially black sure. and white. Um, it has certainly evolved to include lots of cultures, lots of people from different places, uh, sexual orientation, sexual gender identity, all kinds of things are now um, in the mix. And so having people feel like they belong uh, and being included is, is at a premium right now. So we've gone from kind of just counting heads, noses, and belly buttons to how do we ensure that whenever, whomever comes here, that they feel like this is a place where they can contribute and be successful. Um, and, and, and that's huge. Um, the other thing I would say that's different is that people are not afraid to call things out for what they are. Um, mm. In the past, we've had a lot of what I'll call masking words. You know, uh, well, diversity in itself is a broad word, you know, and it's, and it's palatable because it can mean a lot of different things. You know, last year when we got to Black Lives Matter, that was a very clear cut way of saying, you know, all lives matter, all lives do matter, but all lives can't matter if Black lives don't matter, right? Because it's a subset of all lives. So both of those things can be true. And I think that was a real... Uh, a real awakening for a lot of people that, hmm, I need to really dig deeper. I'm a good person. I believe I'm a good person. There's a lot here that I've missed. I don't know. I didn't see whatever you want to call it, but I need to dig deeper. That was a real wake up call for a lot of people across the globe, not just in the US, around the globe. It was a wake up call. Uh, definitely a wake up call across the globe. We saw almost as much um, activity and emotion and energy around uh, racial justice out of our London-based team as much as anywhere in the U.S. Um, I'm very proud to say that you know, members of our London-based team helped build a diversity group within our market research industry called CORE, and that was a direct outcome of the work that they were doing, that Lucid was involved with, and of all the efforts over the summer. So I couldn't be prouder of, of our team in India um, leading that. Um, so yeah, no, that's no, it's great. I mean, look, at the end of the day, people have got to start wherever they are, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you can't, 
you know, once you know better, you've got to do better. So I, I'm not ever fault. I don't ever fault anybody for not knowing better. Maybe you should have, but you didn't. Okay, you didn't. We are where we are today. How do you move forward? That's the real question. How do you give each other grace, right, in these conversations, mm-hmm. which are not easy for lots of people, depending on your background and your own personal experience? How do we give each other grace so that we can have real candid conversations and move forward? I'll repeat that. How do we give each other grace so we can actually listen to each other, regardless of our opinion? Um, and that's something that I've struggled with because of the lack of grace um, that I've seen and probably also contributed to over the years um, and in areas that are emotional or something I gr- disagree with or don't understand. Right. It can be challenging. Yeah. we ju- You just have to stick with it. Right. I mean, mm-hmm. we, we are imperfect and these are imperfect kinds of conversations and imperfect issues. Right. <laughs> so you just yeah. got to stick with it. Well, one thing I've noticed over the past year is the level of engagement by companies on the topic of racial justice and diversity, equity and inclusion. And I think it'd be interesting for us to talk about the hows and whys of of what brings a company to that, what brings a company to start really starting to engage. And, you know, there's a recent uh, kind of barometer that came out by Edelman uh, very recently, really showing how there's a lack of trust in Americans and governments to do the work around diversity, but also huge elevation on businesses being more trusted to address and engage in these topics. And that uh, one thing uh, that I uh, paid a lot of attention to in this is that CEOs are expected to act along these lines, but are often given low marks around performance. There's a, so there's not only an expectation of the CEO, but also there's trust and expectation of a company. And so I, I think if you we could go into the the mind of the or into the boardroom itself and what is the discussion about why why do companies engage on this topic so broadly and make statements, invest and really uh, set a line in the sand around their engagement with uh, diversity and with like say racial justice as an example. Yeah, no, it's a great question. And I think at the end of the day, I'll go back to what, why does the board exist? What does the board do? A board helps to protect shareholder value, stakeholder value, advise the CEO, help provide strategic direction. So in that, all of this impacts the bottom line. You know, the consumer out there, the consumer is so much more plugged in, particularly in the era of social media and media, the consumer is so much more plugged in on a company or an organization with whom they engage as values. What do you stand for? You know, and I go back, you know, if you don't, you know, stand for anything, you know, so if you stand for nothing, you'll fall for anything, right? So mm. at the end of the day, I want to know what do you stand for? Who are you? Before I engage with you, before I spend my money with you, before I refer you to others, before I connect you. So the the value proposition um, is greater than ever to ensure um, that you are representing um, what your constituents and your customers and others um, would, would want you to be. Um, you know, who do I engage with more day to day, my employer or government? For most people, it's their employer, whomever that mm. is. That's who, I, that's who I see every day. That's where colleagues are. So I'm getting information there. I want to know what that information is. I don't necessarily um, engage with government every day in that regard. So um, it matters. It really matters. And again, if you look at some of the studies that are out there, particularly the Edelman Trust Barometer, it has quantified it in a way that is undeniable. Yeah, I, I definitely see that. I, I was reflecting, as you were saying, on how competitive the corporate talent pool is right now. And I think there's across the country, talent is very competitive at, 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 across the board. There's not a single CEO that I speak with who doesn't first start talking about the challenges in uh, hiring and retaining talent. Yeah. Yeah. And look, and if you don't embrace your talent pool being diverse, meaning you are recruiting, hiring, developing, and retaining people from a broad array of backgrounds, you are cutting yourself off part of the talent pool because the talent pool is diverse. No no one group of people or no gender has a corner on, um, on intelligence, on innovation, on how to get stuff done. So if you only focus or you only tend to hire people who look a certain way, you're missing the talent pool. And as a board member, that's not cool with me because as a board (laughs) member, I wanna ensure that you're getting the very best talent. Well, I I just wanna 
just drive that idea home is that there is a real battle for talent and not just talent that is diverse. A lot of the best talent wants to be in a diverse environment because they want that challenge that want they want a to increase their cultural competency, but they will also want to learn and grow and diversity Absolutely. creates an environment for learning and growing. So it's not just you, whether or not you're attracting uh, people that look or, or sound a certain way, but also all the talent itself reacts to the diversity and the values of a company. Absolutely. Uh, I have a I have a client in particular I'm thinking of um, who has very little ethnic diversity. It's a very small company, very little ethnic diversity, but the non-ethnically diverse employees um, were very engaged in the social justice stuff. Mm -hmm. Really want to know what is the company going to do? What are the plans? Uh, and that that was very heartening to me because it says it's not necessarily a self-serving thing. It's a, how is this going to serve all of us? How's the landscape? How's the tenor? How's the mood and tone in this company? Is it going to be a place where I want to work because I, as a non-diverse person, want to be in a diverse place. I want to be in a place where everyone is welcomed, where everyone belongs, where everyone can contribute, where everyone can win. And if I may step out on a limb, it also means providing space for those people who disagree with the work itself. Meaning, sure. I've learned, I mean, there are, not everyone believes that the work done on diversity is the right work to be doing, or it's a political issue versus something else. And so I've done a lot of work um, at Lucid, but also my own life to provide space for everyone to have safety and voice. And that's not yeah. easy to do when those voices sometimes adamantly disagree <laughs> on things, right? Yeah. Um, it can be yeah. quite a challenge. That's true diversity though, right? I mean, true diversity isn't one point of view. It's right. the opportunity to, to talk about these things with differing points of view. Um, I've seen people change positions. I've seen people say, we're going to agree to disagree. But in a workplace, in a workplace, I'm going to say that one more time, in a workplace, what matters is that everyone who is working feels like they belong, feels like they can contribute, and feels like they can be successful. Otherwise, you're not getting the maximum out of them. They're not going to bring right. their whole self to the table. So you've got to have a space where people give each other grace, where they can talk about all kinds of issues um, and, and, and accept those. I mean, again, I may, there may be somebody who I vehemently, dis vehemently disagree in their opinion, their view. What I do personally, I try to understand why do they think that? If, if, if somebody thinks very differently from me, I really try to put myself in their head, in their background, in their life experiences to understand why is that different? Why do they think this? Because sometimes then we can reason to say, mm. well, here's why I think what I think. Here's what my life experience has been. Um, and here's why I believe what I believe. And sometimes people will say, oh, I didn't realize that. or Oh, I didn't know that. So you got to have space for everybody. Well, I, I've come to learn that workplace culture is so important to how a company operates, how we attract and retain talent, how we work with other companies, um, because our culture is a reflection of our values. And it's really become more and more obvious to me as we become a larger and larger company at Lucid that the work that has been done by our team to understand our values to really live higher and develop our uh, training on our values has become so incredibly important in success of the business. And it, it's something that I had to, it, if I'm really honest, took me a, a while to figure out is how important those values were and how important that, that culture really is to the success of the business. Because I, I think previously when I was younger, I'd have thought that that wasn't as important. It was like work, being successful in the job as a company was, can you get everything done? The execution of everything. And then yeah. forgetting that the culture of the team is a reflection of that execution, that capability. Yeah. I mean, what you basically what you want is on Monday morning, right? You got two choices. You got the person who's like, wow, it's Monday. I'm get to go to work, you know, go physically, virtually um, engage. I'm excited about that. Or, oh, God, it's Monday, you know, <laughs> and you get the oh, God, Th that person's not going to give you 100 percent. I don't care what they say. They're not going to give you 100 percent. You're not going to get their best thinking. Um, on issues you're trying to solve. But no, I, I think culture culture is important. You know, another question that I tend to look at, um, and this is as a board member, right, with a talent management background, what do your exit interviews say? 
you know, what do people say when they leave? Do they say, yeah, this was a good experience and I'm just leaving because I got a different opportunity or a better opportunity? Or do they say it was a terrible experience? You know, that's something you always got to watch because that's a leading indicator of where your culture is headed. I, I think exit interviews are super important to your point. Um, it's sometimes hard to know if you're getting all the right, all the real data back, right? Because I think that people can be um, cagey sometimes on exit interviews. Sometimes they're sure. brutally honest and sometimes they're very protective for maybe sometimes they're different or same reasons, but exit interviews, I think are fantastically important. We've been using a, a, uh, a product called Tiny Pulse where we literally ask questions once a, I think once every two weeks or once a month of our, of our team, everything from, are you happy to, do you have a good manager? And these are signals and pulses of information that help us identify how the, how the team is feeling, what they're reacting to and keeping it anonymous is really important so that people can be honest in their, their reactions to, to it all. Yeah, what I have found with exit interviews over many years is um, the, the, the more um, young, if you will, I hate to use that word, but your workforce is, just because generationally people are much more candid. I think yep. every generation <laughs> that comes, you know, Gen X, Gen Y, uh, millennials, much more candid than the boomers. So yep. just really more in your face, more, I don't care if you know I said it, I said it. You know? So so I think doing that now, you get more candor than maybe you did 10, 15 years ago. Well, I definitely see, definitely see that candidness in terms of employees looking to hold the company accountable for its work, especially mm -hmm. around going back to racial justice and DEI. Um, you know, there's a whole employee resource group at Lucid whose mission is to make sure that the company and its employees are, are moving that, that uh, agenda forward. And I could be prouder of their work because they really help drive that accountability, but they're also not at all shy about what they think should be done. And that's just, it's very different than the, say the corporate environments I might've grown up in. Yeah, employee resource groups um, are valuable. I have run them, um, I've seen them, help drive revenue, help drive business. Um, it's a it's a it's a big deal. It really helps create a sense of belonging, but it also can help people feel um, more connected to others. You know, there's mm. groups from a, from a racial standpoint, there can be groups of working parents, young parents. You know, if you're relocating people to a city and they don't know the childcare situation or whatever, here's a group that you can get tips and suggestions. So I have always found those groups uh, military veterans, you know, people who have shared a unique experience mm -hmm. in their background. I have found those to be uh, very, very helpful uh, in helping to create that positive and connected culture in a company. I see them as amazingly valuable as, as we all uh, self-identify or through actions or otherwise who, who we want to, uh, to be our community. That's when going back to our original concept of building communities, one of the core values at Lucid at first, that community was New Orleans. That was where we we're headquartered, so that was easy to adopt. But eventually, we realized community is more than just a physical place. It is the yeah. communities that we identify with that we find ourselves in. And then really asking our employees, asking our team to be intentional about identifying those communities and actively supporting and engaging with them as a part of the work that the, the company does. And so this really goes back to that core value that we have of, of building community. Yeah, building community matters. I mean, and, and, and New Orleans in particular is a series of communities. It's a series of neighborhoods. I mean, that's truly what New Orleans is, which is not, not exclusively uh, unique to New Orleans, but it's, that doesn't exist everywhere. And people very much identify with their neighborhood or their community. So it's a, it's a narrative that I think plays well here. I agree, completely agree. Well, I have, I have three questions that I always ask at the end. Um, and so I want to run those by you as well. Um, the first one is, what was the first job that you ever had and what did you learn from it? The first job that I ever had, gosh, real job, like, you know, part-time job. <laughs> money, money, cash money. Cash money job. Hmm. Well, the first job I had was at GE, actually. I was, I was wondering, was, was it going to be the yeah. internship at GE? Okay. Yeah, yeah. That was the first sort of paid job. I mean, I did some other stuff. I worked, um, well, actually, I worked at the Louisiana legislature uh, hmm. briefly when they were in session in the summer. But I'll, I'll speak to the GE job. So as an intern, um, 
I learned a lot about corporate culture. I learned a lot about how people show up. Um, I learned about politics, corporate politics, <laughs> if you will. Um, I learned that I shouldn't be afraid to ask questions um, and that questions were welcomed. I learned what a good leader looks like and what a not so good leader looks like. And I learned resilience because interestingly, and I'll, I'll just share this, the person who, with whom I worked, the person I worked for as an intern um, offered me a job, um, you know, as I was finishing grad school, want you to come work for me on this training program. Well, before I finished grad school, so we're talking in a matter of a couple of months, he got promoted and moved on somewhere else in the company. Oh. So all of a sudden now, yes, yeah, so all of a sudden now I am uh, working for somebody I've not met. Um, and I'm right out of grad school, so I'm quite young. Um, and so, you know, he, the guy that I worked for said, look, if you want to come to this other location, I will find a spot for you because you did work for me and this is what you signed up for. And I said, no, you know what? I said, I've already started looking at apartments in uh, the Washington DC area. I'm going to stick it out. Uh, but I appreciate knowing that you're out there for me if, if things don't go, um, as well. Good, good. The I, I was wondering if it was going to be internship, um, and I'm glad you talked a little bit about how you got that internship. What was the process whereby that internship became a possibility for you? Yeah, well, well, I was recruited. I was at I was at Southern University in the master's okay. program, and GE okay. to recruit. And and to your point, if I were to be very honest, um, around diversity earlier, there were a number of people who uh, were on the team. Um, who were not in favor of GE going to an historically black college and university and looking for talent. So th the reason the person I worked for was uh, very open to me, maybe not going where I planned to go, but going where he got promoted to was because he knew the dynamic there. Now, right. I didn't realize I didn't realize how strong it was because there were a number of people who were like, is this the right school? Is this the right kind of per all? I mean, it was a lot of dynamic there, but um, that's why I said it taught me real resilience and how mm. to, you know, do my job, be smart about it, um, how to how to how to figure out who who was friendly in the group, who could I right. you know sort of connect with. Uh, it was not easy, but I did persevere, and again, it taught me resilience. Resilience for the win. the The second question is about feedback in a professional environment. Uh, you know, we get reviews, we get feedback, and the I guess the question is. What's the hardest, but also the best bit of feedback you've ever received? Maybe not being as detail oriented as I could have been in, in, in a particular job. So, you know, if you have the person who's big picture visionary, then there's the detail person who's, you know, grinding it out, knows where every T is, every I is. Um, I was probably more on the visionary strategic big picture. Okay. So, so when I got the feedback, you know, of course, nobody likes feedback that's like, ah. but you got to figure, okay, well, what do you do about it? Right. So I did a couple of things, I, which, which I think are worth sharing. One, I tended to try to focus more. So I would allow myself to say, okay, this is not my strong suit. So let me allow more time to do this. Let me be intentional about, you know, if I have to do something, let me look at it. Let me put it down. Let me come look at it another time. So I was intentional about trying to be much more detailed about it. And then the other thing I did as I led a team, I ensured I had detailed people on my team because I do think it's really important when you have a team to balance out skill sets and background and experience. So I, there were people on my team that I was always say, take a look at this and let me know what you think. So Deb, the, the final question, more of a personal one is, What's the most important lesson that you learned from your mother? Yeah, so my mother um, passed away a year ago at the age of 90. Um, 90. She had a very long wow. 90. She had a very long and beautiful life and is well known in the New Orleans community. She taught at McDonough 35 High School for almost 40 years. So she taught multiple generations of families. Lots of people in the city know her. Uh, Miss Aug is what the, her name was, Miss Augustine, but Miss Aug. Um, I think what she taught me is understanding that, you know, you are, you should be comfortable wherever you are, be comfortable in your own skin and wherever you find yourself. So it was very much around, you know, you may not have experienced everything that um, everyone you're around has. You may not have traveled every place that everyone around you has. But if you're confident to ask questions, know that you're smart, 
So any question you ask is an appropriate question. It doesn't mean you're dumb. You just have not had that experience. Ask questions, learn, look things up, be inquisitive. Um, mm. And, and that w- that'll take you far. And I think the second thing, if I could give a close second, was um, to just be self-confident. You know, just be confident that 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 what I bring to the table matters uh, and never take no. She was always a person who would fi- she would find a way. She would find a way to make things happen. And so I take those things uh, from her. Well, it sounds like an amazing woman. It sounds like you take take after her quite well. <laughs> Thank you. I take that very much as a compliment. It is. I wish I had gotten to know uh, Miss Og ever. So with that, uh, this episode is at its conclusion. Uh, so Deb, I appreciate your time with us going through your, your history, the, the board, uh, your approach to um, diversity, equity, inclusion, racial justice, really thinking back over the past year and how companies have or have not played a role in that and how important that conversation around cultural competency can really be to a company and why they pay so much attention to it in terms of how they engage and retain uh, talent besides maybe just being the right thing to do. Uh, But with that, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me, Patrick. It's been a pleasure. Be sure to subscribe to our show wherever you get your podcasts. For information on ResTech, our complete list of episodes and more, visit luc.id slash looking glass.